Today we'll be talking about dealing with ordinary trauma and I have got my guest with me, Dave Orton. Dave Orton has developed himself as a leader and coach for over 20 years. His training background includes Dale Carnegie, Landmark Worldwide, Toastmasters, and many other programs, seminars, and volunteer organizations. He's a Master of Acknowledgement, a certified NLP practitioner, and has been a paid coach since 2014. Hi, Dave. Very good to see you. How are you today? Hi, Ronnie. I'm doing really well. Thank you so much for having me. This is a, a conversation I'm really looking forward to. It seems like we have got a few things in common. I have done Toastmasters and I have done Landmark Forum. Yeah, those are great programs, aren't they? Yes. Your bio says he is a master of acknowledgement. Tell us something about that. Hmm. Well, instead of telling you about it, would you allow me to acknowledge you, Ronnie? Thank you. So, Ronnie, to me, and I've had the opportunity to sit with you for a day-ish <laughs> at an event with your children and interact with your husband. So from that, to me, you occur as being a master of interpersonal communication, a master of caring for people. You occur to me as connected with the divine or with the infinite intelligence that allows you to see into people and make a huge difference as a psychiatrist, as a mother, as a wife. I, I have been able to observe how you interacted with your children. And what I know about you is that you are loving. That's who you are at your core, and, and you know that. I mean, we all are at our core, we are love. And I've been able to see your loving in action, and it is loving, and it's guidance, and it is mother without overbearing, and that is so powerful. I, your children are so lucky <laughs> to have you as their mother, and Siraj he is so lucky to have you as his, as his partner. That's who you are to me, and that is, I acknowledge you for that. And I am loving who you're being. And that's what I mean when I say I'm a master acknowledger, is that I can see the greatness and acknowledge the greatness in people, oftentimes when they can't see it themselves. Now, here's the funny thing, right? You already know that. <laughs> you, you feel that. Now, you won't admit that because you're in Britain and that would be impolitic. That would be not appropriate, right? But at your core, you know these things. And so long as you know them and so long as you live from those ways of being, your impact in the world to transform mental health care in the world, starting off with the UK, will be a natural extension of who you are. I mean, I, I assert that it is. So that's, how's that for, uh, what does that mean? <laughs> wow. Now, I was not expecting this. I, I thought you would say the definition of Master of Acknowledgement is this, and Am I so glad I asked you? So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, my pleasure. <laughs> um, it's been a absolute joy to like listen to you say something about me that um, you know that resonates at a deeper level. And there are times when I don't believe it, but I know that that's not true. So thank you, thank you so much. And what a powerful start to this conversation. So Dave, today's topic is about dealing with ordinary trauma. So, so when we say ordinary trauma, is there an extraordinary uh, trauma? You know, why are we saying ordinary? So do you just want to say a bit about why we chose the, the, you know, the word ordinary rather than anything else? Yeah, so Ronnie, uh, as, as a mental health professional, you deal with the deep, dark, difficult, ab abysmally inappropriate traumas that people go through in life. I'm talking rape, I'm talking uh, the m observing a murder, seeing somebody murdered, or um, having s somebody attempt to, to murder you, or, or you know, very difficult child abuse, things like that that are just very, very difficult to deal with. And I call, I call those extraordinary traumas. Now, they're way more common than people think, you know, s sexual trauma is something that I don't know that we get out of this life without experiencing at least to, to one degree or another, anyone. Uh, but there are definitely those traumas that are, that are extremely difficult that you have to process that counseling is almost required on for a person to have a, a fulfilling life with. So those are what I call the extraordinary traumas, okay? The ordinary traumas are the traumas that occur in the everyday 
that still affect us and affect the way that we view the world and affect the way that we interact with the world and, and who we are being as a person. And so an example of this uh, from my own life would be when I was six years old, I was in the first grade uh, and I was a part of a, I, I wanted to be a part of the, the Star Kid Club. And it was a club that my teacher created to reward the students in her class for going above and beyond the call of duty, if you will. So I would clean the boards after she wrote and I would come back early from recess and, and clean the, the carpets and things like that. Or I'd pick up trash and sure enough, I became a member of the Star, Ki Star Card Club. Uh, and one of the benefits of this club was that you were able to get up and get a drink of water without permission. You didn't have to ask. And I thought that meant all the time. And so we were taking a test and I got up and got a drink of water and sat back down. And my, my first grade teacher came over and very angrily said, give me your star kid club card. <laughs> and so she took the card and she ripped it up in front of the class and said, you know, you're not allowed to get a drink of water during, during a, a test. And she threw the card away. And, oh. and that is not the same as being molested. That is not the same as, as a murder attempt. And the way that I interacted with people was changed from that because I realized that I was missing something and I had to be careful. I had to play it safe. And that was something that I made up at age six that I have, that stayed with me for until I realized that, that I had made that up at age six. And uh, so that's what I mean when the ordinary traumas. Uh, so like somebody looking at you funny and you taking it to mean that you had to be, you had to, you know, keep your hoodie down and your earphones on all the time, or a teacher saying, no, that's not correct. And, and kids laughing at you in school. That is a trauma that is not necessarily a trauma until we accept it as such. And I, I would define a trauma as anything that changes who you are being or the way that you interact with the world in a negative way. So something that makes you smaller, something that contracts um, who you're being in the world, diminishes who you're being in the world. And it is not, and here's the funny thing, right? One person's trauma can be absolutely nothing to somebody else. Like it just can not even matter. They can laugh it off. Or they don't even notice in some cases, right? And in other cases, it's the world has come crashing down around my, my ears, so to speak. Um, and, it, and it's funny because it's even things like what could be considered a, in the legalist sense, a, a, a sexual assault. Like I was, I was working, uh, volunteering with my children's marching band at a band, at a, at a concert. And this woman came to purchase something and she was very, very drunk. And she reached for my, my chest. And, and then she reached for my, uh, reproductive region. And I backed away as quickly as I could. But, she, you know, she touched, she made contact, you know, and she was like, hey, baby, blah, blah. You know, she was coming, trying to come on to me. Now, for me, it was like no big deal. I'm like, okay, back away, drunk lady. She's not in her mind. That's not a big deal. I'm, I'm not affected. I was not traumatized by that because I'm able to defend myself. If some drunk guy had done that to my wife, it's very likely that she would have been traumatized and very likely that I would have gone to jail for, you know, beating the crap out of him. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what I mean when the, the trauma is, is not so easily classified and why I brought up the topic today of ordinary yeah, trauma. No, absolutely. I get you. you know, um, it could seem like ordinary, but it has a profound impact for the person, the specific person at that time. And, and based on the, it might just shape how they they see the world, how they view themselves, and how how they view others. And I tell people, and you know, there's this big trauma and there's like small traumas or little traumas. You know, I, we used to call say that in that tapping, that EFT that I used to do in the past, uh, emotional freedom techniques. Mm -hmm. And I uh -huh. used I had many small traumas like, peppered throughout my life. And until I started doing work on myself, I would make it mean, oh, this means I am not good enough. So the overall theme was I'm not good enough. And then I was looking for the evidence. Oh, that incident that happened, you know, when I was six years old and the incident that happened at nine years old and people laughed at me. And, and I know that 
this is not just for you and me, Dave. It's for everyone because we have this power of thought and we can make things up. And in, in that moment, we are genuinely upset or distressed or hurt, and then we make it mean something. And the thing is that although some people go about their life thinking this is who they are, and I have been like that, and I'm assuming that maybe for a part of your life, even you went about thinking that's who uh, you, know, you are. We know that that's not true. And that's the conversation I'm going to have with you because I know that you also call yourself a deep coach. So that's where I want uh, us to bring because we need to see something deeper about us. That's what you, you have already alluded to, that there is something that we think this is who I am or this is how I'm being in the world or how we see the world. But we need to move away from that because it doesn't serve us, does it, Dave? It, it really doesn't. And the fact of the matter is that we have the, we cannot help but create who we are being in the world. Like how we occur to us, occur, occur to ourselves is everything. And, and how other people occur, occur to us is also created. It's not reality. It's something that we make up. Um, I have a, an example of this where, uh, so I, I love that you did it, that you do EFT. I also am an EFT practitioner um, and, and it's fantastic for the ordinary traumas. It is so useful to just evaporate those. Um, but to the point that I'm, I would like to share, or the story I'd like to share if I may, uh, I, so I speak Russian fluently. I have a Russian degree. I spent a couple of years in Russia back in the mid nineties, uh, not loving the situation that they're in right now. But the, the point is, is that one time my wife and I were on a vacation and we were sitting at a table with these people from Armenia that had immigrated it to the US. And he spoke some English and she didn't speak very much at all. And she was this friendly, kind, older lady that did not speak English. Because of that, I made a presumption, I made up a story about her that she was not intelligent, that she was just a nice, loving, kind lady that was not very intelligent. Now, then I remembered, well, they were in part of the Soviet Union. I wonder if they speak Russian. So I leaned over to her and I said, how are you doing in Russian? And she went, it was like a, a light switch. She was like, someone speaks the language that I speak. And she started speaking in a Moscovian accent. I mean, just the, so much better than my Russian. I mean, you know, and I studied Russian for years and she's like, no, 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 no. She can speak her, that language so well, it's unbelievable. It turns out that she was a doctor of uh, pedagogy. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that word, by the way, when we read it. <laughs> um, and she got her degree from the University of the, um, the, the Government University of Moscow, which in US parlance is equivalent to um, Harvard or Princeton. It's an, it, it, just a fantastic university. And I suddenly went from real, went realizing that the story I had made up about her was not reality and how I listened to her or how she occurred to me went from kind hearted, unintelligent person to kind hearted, brilliant master of teaching. And that's, that was in an instant. So this, this, uh, the way that we react to others and ourselves is a created and not always accurate, uh, interpretation of reality. That's true. Absolutely. So say we realize that, say we realize, okay, we interpret things. We, it's not, uh, it's not the reality, but it's my personal reality. How would you coach someone to change the reality? Well, there are a couple of steps that I take in doing this. Okay. Uh, the first one is to draw attention to the stories that people have made up unintentionally from the ordinary traumas and even the extraordinary traumas in their lives. And the judgments that they have made against themselves. And then I walk them through a process that uh, I call radical self-forgiveness. And it's not just me, there are, lot, there are a lot of people that call it. Sometimes it's called compassionate self-forgiveness. But basically it is recognizing that you were doing the best you could with what you had available as resources in the moment when you encountered these things in life that, that, made, that gave you these judgments that you, that you judged yourself for. And to bring just an enormous amount of grace to that, to that, to you, to the person I'm coaching with. 
and recognize that because of that, you are not at fault, you're not to blame, and to re forgive yourself for that. And sometimes, you know, EFT, emotional freedom technique, I sometimes refer to as emotional forgiveness technique because it's also a fantastic way to forgive yourself for the judgments that you've made against yourself. So there are a lot of different modalities, but once we have forgiven, once the, the person I'm coaching has forgiven themselves at a deep level for the judgments they've made about themselves and other on the way that life is, then we create from possibility who they would, would like to be, who they, would, who they are being in the world. And it is a possibility, okay? What I mean when I say possibility is they may not be the fulfillment of that already in the world. They may not be, uh, you know, a business owner of a business that's bringing in $12 million a year right now. They may only be bringing in a couple of hundred thousand. They may only be bringing in three million, whatever it is. We create them as the fulfillment of their possibility. So it would sound like, uh, I am the owner of a $12 million a year business that is flourishing and providing excellent services in the community. Or I am uh, loving myself and my family. I am showing love to my spouse. Whatever it is, they, it's, the important thing is that it, it is theirs and they're the ones that are choosing it. Okay? Because it has to come from their source. It has to emerge from who they are actually being. Now... Um, in my NLP training, uh, and you'll probably recognize this uh, as a fellow practitioner, when you chunk down, when you, when, you, when you ask the question for what purpose or because of why, uh, why are you this way, you know, or why is this important to you, all the way down to the very bottom, so far as I can tell, the answer is always love, or almost always love. Because of that, I assert that these things that are emerging from people come from this space of who they are at their true core, which is lovingness or an expression of divine love or however that works for your belief system. Um, for me, I'm a believer. So for me, it's that I am a child of God, that I am an expression of God's love or an expression of the divine love. And I have no problem with any other person's interpretation or view of who they are so long as they acknowledge that they are love. So they create this. They create who they're being. And then it is simply a matter of living into that being. And, it, and I use a, a, a distinction I call the acorn oak tree distinction. Okay. And that the, the acorn is the possibility of an oak tree, a majestic 150 year old king of the forest or queen of the forest. And all the oak has to do, all that the acorn has to do to become an oak tree is to be the oak tree and create the conditions or have the conditions required to have that happen. Well, we have a lot more power over our lives than an acorn has. Like an or acorn cannot choose to be planted, but we can choose to plant these possibilities in ourselves and live from the fulfillment of them. And it doesn't matter whether you're an acorn, a sapling, uh, a 20 year oak or a 150 year oak tree. I acknowledge you from the possibility of that 150 year old king of the forest oak tree. And that is the coaching, that is the way that, it, that coaching occurs for me. And the only other thing to do is remove blocks as they come up. And it can be uncovering other ordinary traumas or uncovering extraordinary traumas that were hidden or uh, come figuring out how to enroll your spouse or your loved ones into the possibility of, of who you are being. And enroll not like is in enrolling in college, but cr create that future for them in a way that they are uplifted and inspired by who you're being. So that is, in a nutshell, how I do my coaching. Wow. So there's a lot to take in. So let's break it down a little bit. You, you talked about radical self-forgiveness. And I think that's the step that perhaps we try to skip because we want to achieve a goal. So people might not come to you and me saying, oh, I want to work on the trauma, but the trauma might you know, come up because you are, we are looking at where, what area in their life they haven't been able to forgive themselves. This step is so important, uh, important to acknowledge, and yet many might skip this. And I guess some people think, oh, I need to forgive someone else. But what I'm hearing from you is, forget someone else, let's start with you, let's start with us, and self-forgiveness. But 
do people not find it difficult to forgive themselves even if you you know you say the, the things that you say in terms of you know they did the best they could given the resources they had do you think that there is still a lot of attachment to like i can't forgive which also like is a block of actual forgiveness and how long does that process take you in a coaching session beautiful questions it depends and, and yes it does vary from person to person you know uh, the the judgments that we make against ourselves it, it's so it you said how do we forgive others i assert that forgiving ourselves of the judgments that we make about ourselves is the first step to forgiving anybody else for anything else because the the judgment does not exist out here the judgment exists over here with the person who has made the judgment that the person out there needs forgiving you know and and it can be difficult like like you know my my wife had some sexual abuse when she was growing up and it took me years to forgive the person that perpetrated that when i met her she had already worked through that and forgiven that person and it took me years to do that and I eventually did. EFT actually, by the way, was a fantastic method of that. I sat in a room for five hours and worked on just this issue on e with EFT. But, and I love that modality. But um, there are other judgments that can take, that, that do require time. I made a, a judgment against myself when, um, so I, I had a 15 year career in technology that was, that I lost my identity with myself. I, I created, lost is the wrong word. I, my identity became that I am a, what I call the $20 million man, that I made this company that I worked for $20 million. And the moment that things slowed down, they made me redundant. I was, I was let go. Wow. And the judge, and I didn't know who I was anymore. Cause I didn't have, I wasn't, I wasn't traveling the globe. I wasn't setting up, you know, magnificent projects. And I wasn't uh, bringing in all this money for somebody else, for a, a company. And I didn't know who I was. I had no idea that I had conflated my identity, my, my, my self occurring with this job so much until it was gone. And then I was devastated. And it took me a long time to recognize that I had judgments against them, resentment and regret for not taking other options. If only, I call that the song of if only. <laughs> if only I had done this, which is a poison trap. You cannot, that does not serve anything, right? So I had to forgive myself of these judgments. And it's not like forgiving myself of, of evil that I have done. It, it's, it's more like forgiving myself if I'm a child learning how to walk, forgiving myself for falling down. You know, it's, it's that simple and yet so deep that it can take um, a significant amount of time and a significant amount of, of, of being with self to discover what's actually going on. Thank you. And I like the distinction is that for forgiving myself for the judgment. I think and I think people can start with that, right? Because forgiveness could be a huge umbrella term for so many things. And then, oh, what about this? What about this? And what about that? No, but the thing is that we are talking about the judgments um, because, you know, we don't even realize we are judging. And, you know, and many people say this, right? The way we speak to ourselves, we never speak to anyone else like that. It's like... <laughs> All the names yeah. we call ourselves when we think, yeah. damn it, you know, I should have known better. You idiot, how could you have <laughs> no, done this? No. But I, I like this and it's the radical self-forgiveness. It's like, it's clearly something very deep. We are talking about deep work here. You know, we are talking about not just, oh, I forgave myself uh, and then like later on come back. It's like to, to be in that place of radical self-forgiveness, we need to go deep, right? We can't just be from the intellect and try to forgive ourselves. We just need to drop drop in to being, like you said, you know, to be in the moment, to really see that actually I didn't know any better. And, and what I now know is that my judgments about what happened back then is putting me down and I no wonder I can't move forward in this area of my life. Well, it's, it's wonderful what you said. And, and there it's, it's especially difficult when we made these judgments before we knew the words for what the judgment even could be, you know, um, one of the 
powerful things from uh, NLP is is the assigning of visceral or body sensations to um, symbols and 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 like shapes and taking the feelings that were a judgment and and experiencing them in a in a shared meditation or in your imagination uh, or in the co person I'm coaching's imagination as something that they can now touch and feel and 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 notice they don't have to have the words for that and they can dissipate that judgment utilizing some different modalities that that uh that I use, which is simply directing love towards themselves and blessing themselves and recognizing that they did the best they could. And they actually can embrace them, the, the younger version of themselves in their imagination mm -hmm. to, uh, to help them experience all the sensations, all of the feelings, all the thoughts, instead of, no, no, I can't do this. It's I, instead of resisting it, you know, there's, there's this saying that that which you cannot feel, you cannot heal. I assert that also that which you do not allow yourself to feel you cannot forgive. I'm not sure that there's a, a big difference between at the, at the deepest layer between forgiving and, and healing from something, or at least beginning the healing process on something. Um, so I love that there are so many modalities, so many different methods, so many different approaches we can take. Uh, and that you and I have share a lot of these modalities and you have an entire world of training as a, as a, as a, um, as a doctor of mental health, as a psychiatrist that, uh, that I admire and that I love. And I myself use mental health professionals. <laughs> uh, just had an appointment last week with my counselor. And, and it's a beautiful thing that we have. We live in a time not only of, of advanced medicine, but also of advanced uh, mental health and spiritual uh, modalities to deal with things that otherwise would simply be unobtainable. Mm, no, thank you, Dave. I, I'll tell you what stands out for me as you're speaking. <clears throat> I learned NLP a long time ago. I don't use it anymore. And I, um, you know, use EFT specifically for deprescribing. So when people are having problems with withdrawal symptoms, I know you go deeper than just what the techniques are. But there's also something as a coach, you can only take people like how far you have been yourself. So what I'm trying to say here is, I know you're giving a lot of credit to these um, modalities, which are, you know, which can be great and they have their own, you know, they have their usage. But I know from co having this conversation with you that you are clearly pointing people to something very, very deep. And I want to acknowledge that, Dave, just in case I forget later on. I just wanted to share that before we move on. Thank you. I, I totally accept that. And it and it's it is it is true. Uh, I have been through the the deep things. I have experienced the abuse. I have experienced addiction. I have experienced deep depression, prolonged depression. I have experienced loss and grief, and um, and anger, rage, all of these things. And the depth that is available. Now, now here's the other part of this, Ronnie. You cannot know that without having trod that path yourself. So you can't acknowledge me for that without having been in the shadow of the valley of death yourself, which is why you are a fantastic practitioner as well. And it's not just the modalities and it's not just the things or the, the formulas that you learned in uh, or the pathways that you learned in your training. So thank you. I acknowledge you for that as well. And, and you're absolutely correct. Somebody going to a weekend and getting a certification does not have the power to impact a person's soul that you have and that I have. Thank you. So thank you. And I return that acknowledgement. Oh, wow. Beautiful, beautiful. And the term, the, the word that comes to mind is insight. Both of us had very deep insight about, you know, who we truly are, our profound nature, beyond the trauma, beyond the ordinary trauma, beyond the extra extraordinary trauma, beyond the challenges that we, we face as human beings to something much, much deeper. And he talked about love. And the other day I was talking to one of my friends who, who is a GP, 
and, and she had the same view as me that in that in healthcare we don't talk about love, something which is universal and which we are part of. My way of saying to people is that, that what's missing in mental health is just we, we have acknowledged now about the mind and body connection, but we have not acknowledged the mind, body and spirit connection. And then other name for spirit, you can say love, you know, that, you know, our beingness. So can you say something more about love? Yeah, thank you so much for that. That was brilliantly spoken, Ronnie. I just like would take a moment and be with that statement because I have, I have uh, chills and goosebumps from what you just said. It was so powerful. Healthcare in the 1970s and even through the, up until the mid 1980s and early 90s, utterly denied the possibility of a body mind connection. Uh, and then that came into vogue, <laughs> and now we acknowledge that. And you know, meditation and, and massage therapy and ac even acupuncture is included in some Western um, medical. Uh, applications now which is fantastic and the we're still missing this this spirit or love or being connection and I feel like the the power of this is expressed in what I call coaching now I really don't even like the word coaching uh, it, 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 you know, people say coaching. So are you a life coach? I'm like, I don't like that term very much because I mean, yes, I guess so. And I'm a business coach and I'm a relationship coach and I'm a communications coach and I've coached little league baseball and I've, you know, I've coached a team of, what does that mean? I don't know. It's, it's a word we use as a placeholder for something that is not really very well defined. And love is the same way to your point. We have terrible definitions of love. <laughs> It, it, at least in at least in English, you know. Um, so what I refer to when I refer to love is the experience of being. In believers speak, in my in how I refer to it as a believer is the presence of the Spirit of God. As a, as a as someone who is a technologist, I refer to it as presence, being present. As someone who enjoys the poetry of Rumi, that great Sufi mystic, I refer to it as Rumi's field, this place beyond good and bad, where we are the same. There I will meet you. Uh, as a coach, I've heard of it referred to as the self with a capital S. Um, other times people refer to it as intuition or, you know, the, their spirit guides, the angel guides. I have no problem with, there's this statement that one of my coaches uses, which is that more than one thing can be true at the same time. And you've heard him say that. I know that because I was there with you. <laughs> um, uh, and, and more than one thing can be true at the same time. How you experience this expression that I call love or spirit or being a child of God or being an expression of divine love. I am unattached to that so long as you as we agree on that the experience of it as as source experience as coming from the depth of who you are being as opposed to your titles or your cultural background or your religion or your political affiliation or your preferences. So that's what I mean when I say love that you are love that I am love. Now there's a, another dimension to this which is who I am being, I declare myself that I am loving. Now, that seems natural from being this, uh, from a source of love, from being a, from my source love, that if I declare myself to be loving, that my actions will be loving actions. My actions will be kind. Now, there's a distinction here of kind and nice. A person who is kind is loving. A person who is nice can be loving, but is more likely to just be trying to either get through a situation or be an expression of a people pleaser. So as an, as a, as a kind of a graphic example of this, a nurse who is in a burn unit, who is scrubbing the third degree burns off of a person's skin, subjecting them to excruciating pain is kind 
is loving because what they're doing is given from a source of long-term health and well-being. The nice person would put salve or bandages on the third degree burns, hoping to mitigate the pain and get a short-term gain of no pain and have this long-term cost of scar tissue and loss of motion and all the other unpleasant things that come from not dealing with the root cause of things. Now, there's another thing that came to me while you were speaking about deep coaching. These, in the absence of experience and in the absence of having gone deep yourself, in the absence of having gone through the dark night of the soul, a practitioner is left with techniques. A practitioner is left with formulas to go from point A to point B with a person. Again, there's nothing wrong with this, and it still val can be very valuable. And I assert that a person is left hacking at the branches of the tree instead of the, the, the base of the tree or the, the trunk of the tree. They can't get to the source until they themselves have gone through the deep things. What I'm hearing here is you know, not everyone would have extraordinary trauma, but, uh, and, but many people, everyone would have ordinary traumas, multiple. It's about doing some work on yourself. I just love the distinction between kind and nice. And something tells me that you are a kind coach. <laughs> Not a nice coach, Dave. You are a kind coach. <laughs> does, it, does it make sense? Does it ring a bell? It does. It does. Well, and, and I've learned from the best, you know, my coach, uh, one of my coaches, uh, the first time I met him, and I, it's in a, a book that, that uh, is about him and that brought us together, actually called The Ultimate Coach, um, wherein the first time he met me, he looked me up and down. And this was a time before I had gone through much of anything. You know, everything was still very surfacey. And he said, Dave, you are the most pretentious son of a bitch I have ever seen in my life. And that was him being kind, not nice. What he was saying is not you're a terrible person because you're fake. He was saying, I love you. And I'm sensing that you are putting on a show and wearing a mask because you think it will get you something. And with me, it will not. So first thing we're going to do is get that mask mask off of you as quickly as we can and deal with what's really going on. Excuse me. Yeah. Deal with what's really going on. <laughs> Wow, amazing, amazing. Yes, um, what um, I haven't got first-hand experience of uh, Steve Hodgson, but from powerful stories like this of transformation, just by being him, a kind coach, not a nice coach, is makes him the ultimate coach because he has a very, um, his unique way of working with people. We talked about the radical self-forgiveness, and then can you can you just guide people through what they could do if they if if they you know no longer want to hide behind a mask uh, and be a people pleaser and they want to be more authentic and at the same time vulnerable because when you're being authentic we are being vulnerable you know in that we are just showing up as who we are in that moment rather than anything else yeah so i can give you some 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 pointers on how to do this uh it can be very difficult to do this on your own right. and without somebody else to listen or to assist you um, because in the in the echo chamber of my own mind, I have noticed that I make things up that are not true and fret about them as though they were very often, you know. Um, so that being said, there are some things that you can do. Uh, the first thing is to notice in your life where you have had a uh, where, where you feel kind of dead or stuck or not as happy as you could be notice the areas in your life where you are having complaints. Once you have recognized that, the next step is to look at the complaint and or look at the, the issue or look at the area that's sad and find out if you can recall when in your life it went from the, the on switch was turned off. Okay. Or when there you started noticing that instead of being alive, you became dead <laughs> or not fully self-expressed is another way of saying that. 
around that time in your life, you're going to find an ordinary trauma or an extraordinary trauma, something that happened that it sounds like in your mind that made you judge or made you decide that the world was a certain way or that you were a certain way. Now, in reality, it didn't make you do anything. There was a, an experience that happened and you made that mean or you judged yourself that it mean or you judged the world that it meant whatever you made it mean, okay? And then comes in this, this grace step of recognizing that as a human being at that time in your life, at that age, you were doing the very best you could with what you had. You responded in a way that allowed you to survive. How do we know this? Well, you survived. Your unconscious mind, our unconscious mind, one of the designed, designed, one of the purposes of it is to keep us alive, to keep us surviving, still breathing. And it doesn't care about whether we're happy. It cares about whether we're breathing, breathing and breathing. That's about it. <laughs> so to recognize that it fulfilled its mission, you're still alive. You're still breathing. You still have time to deal with things and that you were doing the best you could. And to add this grace, this lovingness, this unconditional love as a gift from you, your deep self to you, this child or this young person or this adult who went through this thing and, and had a judgment come out of it allows for the un releasing of, of that. Now, so that, that is kind of the, the first steps there. Okay. Now there are things where they are held so tight or they are so tightly combined with your identity that you are so in, you, you, you get so much juice out of being a victim from them that it's very difficult to let them go. You know, an example of this is, uh, say you were at a restaurant and, and somebody spilled you spilled your coffee and it was way, way too hot, you know? And so you have burns and you go to the hospital and then you sue the restaurant for eh, a couple of million dollars, right? You're not going to let that go. You're not going to forgive yourself or them for that because you are invested in your victimhood. And, you know, it's the same way with, uh, say you have a cancer that, that you believe was caused by your exposure to a certain thing and you're part of a lawsuit and you have a, a financial interest in being a victim. You can try to forgive yourself. It ain't going to work. <laughs> it is not going to work because you have a vested interest or you're getting too much out of being a victim. So part of this is recognizing where you are getting a payback or a, 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 a kickback. Yeah, what we call a secondary or, gain. Uh, we call secondary yes, gain. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> secondary gain from this that is so costly. Whatever you think you're going to get from the lawsuit, Sorry, your aliveness is so much more valuable than that. Uh, whatever you think you're going to be from continuing to be a victim in a relationship and be able to hold that over somebody's head and say, you did this to me. Being able to have that do that, yes, it has a, second, a secondary uh, benefit, but it is not, it is so costly. Because you don't get to be alive. You just get to be a victim. So in those cases... You, it, it, very often you need a coach to, to be nice, not to be nice, to be kind to you. Yeah, I was about to say that, yeah. <laughs> and call you out on your baloney, on your BS, whatever you want to call it. Because sometimes you can't see it. That stuff is often hidden to our view. But if you're not dealing with that, you can forgive yourself. And then the next step is to create what you would like to have or who you would like to be as a possibility. And dream big. See, the other part of your unconscious mind is once you give it instructions and are not encumbered by judgments, it goes about arranging the universe to the way that you believe and expect and create yourself to be. It's, it's not magical, but it feels like magic. <laughs> it's not a miracle per se, but it feels like a miracle. The real miracle is that, that we are here having this experience and have the opportunity to know this. You are a miracle. I am a miracle. We give and receive miraculous value all the time. And if we can notice that, then it's a miraculous life. Beautiful.
Well, thank you, Dave. Just to say that if someone listening has a deep trauma, please don't try to do this by yourself. And if you're not in the um, phase where you, you feel powerful and you, do, you, you feel that uh, you're feeling very vulnerable, then please don't go there. You know, your you best bet is to work with a coach or a counsellor. It might be that, the, you know, you might need a gentle approach. But what I'm hearing clear, clearly that at some point, just nice and nice and nice and nice is not going to do much. At some point, you need to get ready for the kind coach, the kind counsellor who is going to say to you, because they love you, they really see that you, you are this miracle, but then you are, and again, you might not know this, but you know, you are uh, unconsciously in the victimhood and you don't even know it. And it might be that it might take a few sessions for you to have a an insight like, oh, wow, this is what I'm doing. And I, I know that I don't want to settle for a life like that. When we work with someone and we give them permission to be not just nice all the time, but also to be kind in that they point out our blind spots. That's when we are going to have a breakthrough. That's how we can really deal with those ordinary traumas once and for all and, and fall back into our true power rather than thinking, oh, I'm going to be a victim because of what happened um, in, in the past. Does it make sense, Dave? Mm -hmm. it, it makes beautiful sense. And uh, I'd like to distinguish that a person can be gentle and kind at the same time. Uh, and you, as a, I mean, I use, like I said, mental health professionals and I use coaches. I hire both of them. And the, I highly recommend that you go with a, a counselor or a, a psychiatrist for the extraordinary trauma. Coaches are trained well on, on helping to build a foundation. Deep coaches are, are, are trained well on dealing with trauma and building a foundation on which you can build your future and build your life. Um, and we can do some healing and we, there are some extraordinary trauma coaches out there. In my experience, uh, that is very useful after, <laughs> after I have gone through and done the work with my counselor or done, done the work with my psychiatrist, done the work with my mental health professional. So I acknowledge and, and love and bless everybody that is wherever they are in that, in that space. And, uh, and a person can be kind and gentle. One of the things that I'd like to call out is that if, if you're not hearing love, if you're not feeling love, if you're not in a space where when somebody is calling you out kindly and from love on something, advocate, speak how that is occurring for you. That feels like an attack. Was that an attack? No, no, not an attack. Okay, so I need to add more gentleness to this kindness. What I am seeing is that you are wearing a mask. Can you see the mask? Is kind and gentle. It's more gentle than your pretentious SOB, you know? <laughs> and the beautiful thing about my coach is he could tell that I was ready for it right then and there. So it is incumbent upon a coach, especially one who is a deep coach or somebody like yourself who is, has depth in their profession to listen for where the person is and speak to them in the way that they can hear. And, and that's incumbent on us as, as part of our powerful listening. And I assert you've got that because a person who didn't have that would not have been able to draw that distinction. Thank you, Dave. Wow. I could talk for, you know, another hour or so, but we need to bring this to close. But this has been so rich. Although we said that we are going to share, talk about uh, dealing with ordinary trauma, we also have also gone very, very deep. So anyone listening to the conversation, I'm sure they will have loads to reflect on. And I would say, listen to this once uh, or watch this once and again, come back again and then perhaps make some notes as you go along to see what really stood out for you in what um, Dave had to share with us today. So Dave, if people get genuinely curious about you and your work, where they can, where can they find you? They can find me a couple of places. Uh, on Facebook, if you search for uh, Deep Coach Dave Orton, you'll find me there. Um, my website uh, is five days to own your life dot com. It's a it's a challenge that I've run in the past and I enjoy it, so I've kept that website. And you can uh, reach out and request a a, a a no cost get to know you session there to talk through things. Um, if you, you know, if, if you'd like to have a, a 
conversation about coaching, you can also schedule something there and just say interested in coaching or interested in finding out more about your coaching. Um, yeah, you can also find other podcasts that are there. I highly recommend a couple of books. Uh, one of the books that I'm in is The Ultimate Coach by Amy Hardison and, uh, and Alan Thompson. Uh, also, there's a, another book that I'm not in that I highly recommend, which is called Loyalty to Your Soul, um, which deals a lot with the uh, and actually walks people through the steps of they call it compassionate self forgiveness. Uh, and it is, it is a beautiful, very gentle way to approach that uh, for yourself and, and with your loved ones. Thank you, Dave. I mean, you're all bundled into one, isn't it? You're a you know, gentle, kind, nice coach. You are a deep coach. You are, you are a master of acknowledgement. And, you know, I just felt the love when you were sharing everything from your heart. So thank you so much, Dave, for this amazing conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I know the listeners or the viewers will definitely enjoy this. So thank you for your time today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Ronnie. And uh, I, if I may just say one more time how much I appreciate and, and, and honor the mission that you and Dr. Gogoi. Yes. Did I say that right? <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Suraj are on. Um, and I, I support you and I'm, I am here to just to add my voice to your voice uh, if, if you need it at any time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave.